As we look at our gospel reading this morning, it comes from the Gospel of Mark once again, and we're looking at chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Uh, before I read this, I wanted to say that uh, John the Baptist is the one who opens Mark's gospel here. And John is really a throwback to the prophets of old. The descriptions that we hear uh, about John in Mark's gospel really call to mind similar descriptions that we hear in the Old Testament of Elijah the prophet. And the locusts that John eats were considered clean food uh, found in the list in Leviticus 11.22. And this indicates that uh, John really is out living off the land. He's eating a poor diet, but he's still remaining uh, clean in the holy sense of the word from the law. And John really does invite us into this story. And I would invite us to hear it once again. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, we are your thankful people. We are grateful to gather here together for worship and to hear your Word proclaim as we consider John the Baptist calling people to repentance of sin, preparing the way of our Lord let us truly understand this word today for our lives. May it become real, that we may become more real in Christ Jesus. We pray these things in His holy name. Amen. Have you ever watched the show Cheers when it was on television? Years ago, we have a few that watched Cheers. That was one of my favorites uh, a while back. I won't say how long ago that was, uh, if you're younger than that, but it was a while ago. Carla was the waitress in this bar in Boston on Cheers, and she was awful uh, as far as the, her temperament and everything was just bad all the time. And that was kind of her character. That was her role to play. But in one episode, she found out that her son was becoming a priest. He decided to go into the priesthood. And so she was so excited that he was becoming a priest. And her, her demeanor around the customers actually got worse. And she got much more uh, rude with everyone. And, and finally they said, you know, I said, why are you being so extra rude? You know, why are you being so bad like this? And she said, I tell you why. It's because my son's becoming a priest. And when your son becomes a priest, it's a free ticket to heaven. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do. And then she took some scissors and she cut some suspenders off one of the customers. <laughs> And uh, just cut them right there, just suspenders just fall. And she says, right now, God's looking at me and saying, what am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and so this behavior kind of continued. And then at the, towards the end of the episode, her son comes walking in with the woman. <laughs> and uh, she says, uh, hey, uh, you can't be dating her. You're going to the priesthood. And he said, oh, I changed my mind about that. I'm not going to be a priest anymore. And oh, you see the look of horror come across her face as she realizes all this he's done before God just recently. And so she gets down and she really begins to pray in earnest and really to repent of her sin. Um, that was a fun episode in that as we see uh, her in that little microcosm, we see ourselves in that we're not always on our best 
And there are times when we realize it and we need to repent. John the Baptist comes today and opens this wonderful gospel lesson with a call to repentance. Uh, he, it's a baptism that he baptizes of repentance. And so if we think about this, if it's a baptism for repentance and the forgiveness of sins, why does Jesus then go to John for baptism? Our doctrine teaches us that Jesus was without sin. And so we wonder, what's going on here? Why would Jesus be called to this baptism? If we think about this, what does it mean to repent? What does that mean to repent for us? Uh, literally, the Greek metanoia means to change one's mind. And Mark's idea of repentance probably is more than just metanoia, to change our minds. It goes probably back to the Hebrew word, a shuv, which means to change one's ways. Which is a little bit different from, we all know the difference between changing our mind and changing our ways. It involves more than just thinking in a different way. It's this idea of continually be repentant. It's not like a door that we pass through to get into the kingdom. As if once you repent, aha, I am in. Repentance is the ongoing lifestyle of people that live in the kingdom. That's a very different way of thinking about it. Repentant, repent is in the present tense, which means for us to do it over and over and over again. Now we regularly repent. We do this with our confession of faith, or our prayer of confession. We gather, we pray as a congregation each week, and we do it uh, corporately where we pray together. And then we have a moment of silent prayer where we can individually and privately pray for our own confession. Important for us to do so. I had a Catholic friend named Joseph about 10 years ago. He was in the youth group. And uh, I would kind of mess around with Joseph a little bit because I knew he was Catholic. And I asked him, you know, I said, have you been to confession lately? Because I knew that was their tradition and that was a part of what it was. And I, I did this to kind of tease him a little bit, but also I was very serious because I believe it's important for us to embrace this tradition of repentance and confession of sin. And as I mentioned, we do this each week. We visit this idea of confession of sin, and I believe we need this not to bemoan that, oh, we are lower than low, but to remind ourselves to recognize and take responsibility for when we have fallen short. And if we don't account for this often, I think that we find ourselves more and more sliding. It's easy to do. It's easy for all of us to think more on ourselves than on God and on our neighbor. But if we sincerely repent on a week, at least a weekly basis, I believe we allow God to work in our lives and begin to work on the changes that need to take place in each of our lives, even those changes that we know we don't really want. We know we need, but we don't want them. Uh, Josh Billings, 19th century humorist in the United States, said, It is much easier to repent of sins that we have committed than to repent of those we intend to commit. <laughs> That's a little too true, isn't it? <laughs> much easier to repent of the sins that we have committed than to repent of those we intend to commit. Now, I think a part of repentance for us, if we want to be honest with ourselves, is that to pray honestly, God, I'm not ready to give up this portion of my life, even though I know it doesn't do me any good. Help me to change my attitude toward it. This allows God to come into our lives and be in those dangerous aspects of our lives that we know are not good for us. We don't want to just go through the motions of repentance. We don't want to say we're sorry one week and then come back the next and be sorry for the same exact thing. Abusive relationships are like that. You know, it's, it's awful. It's the cycle of violence that happens in families all around our country. The abuser will 
beat up a victim or hit a victim, often a family member, and then when they come into their right mind, they apologize and they promise never to hit again. And I believe they really are sorry. They are trying their best to repent. But then when sufficient time passes, it starts all over again. And it happens again. And why doesn't it work? They really are sorry. I believe that in the moment that they feel genuine remorse for their actions. But I believe that for change to happen, the person needs not only to have a changing of the mind, but a changing of the action. We've got to seek help and make changes. If we were to say to that person, if you really are sorry, you need to get help. You need to seek counseling. You need to find out why these things are recurring in your life again and again. A lot of times, they don't uh, look at that. They look at that as an affront or an attack, and they, they won't uh, follow through with that. They say, well, you think I'm weak? And I believe I can handle this on my own. And what this really means is I'm not working on it because deep down I don't think that I need to change. You see, deep down I understand I'm not the one being threatened. You are. And I'm the one with power in the relationship. And to admit that I have a problem is to let go of some of that power. But isn't that what the cross is really about. To find strength in our weakness. To find power in vulnerability. You know, marriage takes work and commitment. Raising children takes work and commitment. Friendship, real and genuine friendship, takes work and commitment. Faith. If we really want to grow in Christ. Believe me, people, it takes work and commitment. How will we best prepare the way of the Lord? John the Baptist is inviting us today. Prepare the way of the Lord. Christmas is right around the corner as we celebrate the birth of Christ. How do we prepare our hearts and our minds, our lives for Christ? And John seems to be saying through sincere repentance, which means not only change of mind, but change of our actions. <laughs> Why was Jesus baptized by John? He was truly sinless. Maybe it was a movement of turning his head away from temptations and setting them firmly on God. I don't believe it's any coincidence that following the baptism of Jesus, you know what happens in Mark? The very next thing he does, he goes out into the desert to fast and to pray where he is tempted and I'm going to give a spoiler alert. He resists temptation. He resists temptation. He has changed his mind. He has changed his action in a sense of renewing what maybe already was there and saying, I am setting my mind on God. I'm setting my actions on God. This is my public declaration. This is the way I'm going. So, as we think of the things that we harbor deep inside us. What are those things that we need to turn away from this year? What are those hurts and wounds that we carry with us, that we bear as burdens, that we need to let go, and shrug off, and ask God to turn our minds away from those things, turn them on to God, what would it be like to be truly free for Christmas? What would it be like to truly be able to embrace Christ fully on Christmas morning? Frank Pinner was a multimillionaire. He owned a contracting business, and he was not a Christmas kind of guy. He was one of those kind of guys that you look at and you say, uh, Scrooge, you know, he didn't offer any Christmas bonuses to his employees. And when his wife uh, decorated the home for Christmas, he didn't see any reason for it. They'd get in arguments over her decorations for Christmas. He'd say, 
Christmas is for children, and we don't have any children. Oh, my. And so one day he decided to walk to work. And Frank's there walking to work, and as he's walking along downtown, he comes across a department store. People are looking in the window, and they've set up a Christmas display, and there in the display is Mary and Joseph, and the shepherds are arranged, and then the wise men are over here, you know, and they've got this nice display. And then his eyes focus on the Christ child, the baby, there in the manger. Frank turned away. He did not want to look at the child. But as he turned away, his eyes caught another sign across the street, and it said, Holy Innocence Home, there on brown letters. It was an orphanage. And he began to think about his own son, David, who passed away when he was only 18 months old. His only child. It was a thing for Frank that still wounded him. He couldn't even really talk about David or say his name. Even though every day he thought about him, it still grieved him much to say his name aloud. And as he began to look at that orphanage, and his mind goes back and forth from the Christ child to the orphanage, he found himself drawn and moving forward. He remembered a Sunday school lesson from deep in his past about a teacher talking about how King Herod went and killed the baby boys all around the Judean countryside. And it dawned on him that there is more to Christmas than just syrup. There's misery, too. And that evening, Frank and his wife Adele dined by themselves alone. And as they were eating there, he said, I went to visit an orphanage today. And you could have, you know, knocked her off the chair. You know? <laughs> what? What? And she never imagined that he'd do such a thing. He went on, he said, you know, the conditions I found there were, were cramped, and it was kind of like a dungeon, and it was dingy. It was awful. And, and while I was visiting that orphanage, a little boy came up, and he began to stroke my sleeve. He said, I'll never forget it. He said, and you know what I've always said about Christmas? I said, you know, Christmas is for children. Well... It's about time people started doing something for children. And so today, I gave some money to that place, and they're going to build a wing with it. Oh. And Adele was swept away by his kindness and his transformation, but she was unprepared for his next day. They're going to name it for David. May you find life in repentance. May you find joy in repentance. May you find the peace of God in repentance. May you find transformation of your life in repentance. May the Christ child come to you anew this year, born anew in you. John the Baptist says, prepare the way of the Lord. May you prepare your life once more. Amen.